There's a movie that came out recently, or at least I think it was recent, I'm, I might be behind on this, called Ready Player One, which I haven't actually seen myself, but I have seen the trailer, which the way that they make trailers these days is, is about as good as having actually seen the movie, so I feel like I can speak about it authoritatively. The general concept of the movie seems obvious enough as a pretty standard dystopian warning about the potential for humanity to become servile to its technology rather than the other way around. In the movie, it appears that human beings have sacrificed good things about the potential of their lives in the real world out of a kind of slavish preference to escape into their virtual distractions. It looks like people are generally impoverished and suffer an unenviable existence, except for the fact that they are able to escape it and become and do anything they want in virtual reality. When they do so, they become beautiful, interesting, rich, charismatic, and courageous, unlike in the real world where acquiring those things usually takes a much greater degree of effort, ability, and ultimately virtue. Which all sounds great, but you have to imagine that every time they disconnect from that thing that they're escaping into, that, that, that virtual reality, the high of that immersion probably produces an exaggerated low, just like coming down off of some um, highly ecstatic drug, um, where they're probably startled back into the pitiable state of their real lives in the real world. And this dichotomy just amplifies the depressing nature of their condition. Or is it not actually starting to look and sound more like our condition? Cue the profound commentary of the movie. Because let's be honest, what are we doing with most of the technological distractions that we use, whether they be social media, uh, mobile phones, video games, or TV and movies? We're escaping our real lives in pursuit of something more exciting and more seductive. And now that Apple has introduced their virtual reality headset, I think it's time for us to take this quite a bit more seriously because Lots of people have, or lots of companies have tried to introduce something like this in the past. Um, but when Apple does it, it's likely going to catch on. The same thing happened with, with smartphones in the past. A lot of other companies dabbled in this kind of thing and tried to make it happen. But it wasn't until Apple did it that everybody paid close attention and took this enterprise a lot more seriously. And I think that the ill effects of our current usage of technology as a means of escape are already becoming wildly explicit as our technology tempts us away from our real lives in the real world more and more you may notice that that it establishes this kind of competing tension um, between the real world and our distractions such that ultimately we will start to prefer one and resent the other because we're designed for love that's that's sort of the fulfillment of our nature and our, our ultimate calling but before you can love anything, you have to first recognize that there is someone or something that is external to yourself. But the things that we are in the habit of escaping into and the thing that this movie seems to establish as this, this fulfillment of, of what this, this potentially looks like is, is just a world where our Im imagination and our preferences reign supreme. But that's the antithesis of love. That's narcissism. That's turning in towards yourself rather than the first movement of love, which is, again is, is turning to something that is external, recognizing that there is something or someone external to yourself. There's an old phrase that poses a dilemma about the nature of love and the good or the good life that goes something like this. I'm paraphrasing it, so forgive, forgive me if this isn't actually how it goes, but it's something like, did men love Rome because she was great? Or was she great because men loved her? And I would enthusiastically argue that it's the latter. A thing becomes great because it is well loved. A person can take something like an empty and infertile plot of land and they can just love the heck out of it so and turn it into something great, something that is worthy of all of that effort and love. And love in this sense doesn't mean uh, like a, a strong infatuation or affection, but it means to will the good of someone, or in this case, something, something else, and find that in so doing, the object of the lover becomes more lovable, becomes more worthy of that love. 
A good parent does this with their children every day. They take an ignorant and helpless human being and they care for its good. They sacrifice their time, their energy, their bodies in some cases, and their resources to turn that human being into the best version of their potential. Love makes someone or something unremarkable into something great. And this is true of all aspects of our lives, our education, our careers, our homes, our relationships. We can make them better by our willingness to embrace and to love them. But we can also neglect them because of the sacrifices and the struggle that love demands of us. And instead choose to escape those responsibilities for our own selfish and fleeting amusements. And that's how the real world and the real things in that world and the real relationships in that world um, that compete for our attention can fall into decline and dilapidation just like the real world in that movie when we instead prefer our fleeting amusements. And the reality of this principle really pronounced itself to me at a time when I was a, a younger father with little kids because there were times when I found myself just excessively irritated at certain times of the day when I was with my kids. And I was always surprised by these instances when, when they occurred. So I'd be spending time with my family, but not fully attentive to them, especially my kids. Like I'd be scrolling on my phone or responding to some notification and there would be this commotion of activity around me because of the vitality of these little people who are sometimes a little bit desperate for my attention. But I would be busy escaping into my distractions, into my little curated virtual world. And it would come to a point where I couldn't sustain that state of mental withdrawal any longer because the commotion would reach such a pitch that I, I, I couldn't ignore it anymore. My, my attention would be wrestled away from it, from that distraction, which if you're attentive to that experience when it happens, uh, you'll notice that it's, it's a very psychologically distressing experience. And when it would happen, I would find that I would react in an excessively irascible and even angry way sometimes because they're just kids being kids, not even being bad, just kind of grasping for my attention. And I would be short tempered with them as a result. And then later when I would have the chance to compose myself and reflect on it, I would wonder why was I so angry over that? And I realized that the, the transition from the escape or the distraction or the virtual reality back to the real world, the one with adversities and consequences where not everything is organized and curated just the way that you like it, just for you. That experience, that transition is, is painful, even in just sort of small measures and sort of startling if you aren't in the habit of staying and, and residing in the real world. It's like when somebody spends a lot of time in a low gravity environment, like astronauts who go to the International Space Station, who then come back to the surface where they have to experience g-force again and they discover that their muscles have grown weak for not having to endure the adversity of normal gravity force and the the pull and the tension between the two worlds the real world um, the one that we've been placed in and the virtual world of distractions I would argue is anxiety inducing both in the concept of the movie and both in the way that we experience it with the technology and the distractions that we use just like it would be if you were fully immersed in a very sensually pleasing, like a video game world, uh, again, like in that movie, uh, and then being pulled out of it back to the world that you've been neglecting and which has grown wearisome and contemptible because of that neglect. I often go for runs in the morning and every time I start to approach a younger person, like a Gen Zer from behind, those poor Gen Zers, we're always picking on them, aren't we? Um, whenever I'm approaching them from behind, and I know that I'm gonna to have to pass them, I'm always a little bit apprehensive because what usually happens is they become visibly startled when I actually pass them. And the reason that they get startled, I suspect, is because they're always, they always have headphones on or earbuds in and they're always carrying a device that they're mentally lost in. Um, they've become inattentive to the world around them, which means that when the world requires them to be attentive, like a fast moving person coming up from behind them, it's always a startling experience, the kind that will actually make them jump. And the truth is there's no reason to be startled by that experience under normal circumstances, but because of their refusal to remain attentive to their surroundings, 
they expose themselves to this vulnerability and the, the anxiety and all the psychological distress that comes along with it. And think about that. We're talking about the kinds of jump scares in horror movies that rely on cheap thrills because they don't really understand human psychology enough to know what truly scares us. So they rely on simple jump scares, but for good reason, they actually work. Now imagine if the normal, banal, everyday experiences of being alive in the world actually holds jump scares for you throughout the day, wouldn't that start to wear on you after a certain amount of time? Because that's what we're doing to ourselves by seeking to escape and then being violently, at least psychologically speaking, brought back to reality. This world that we inhabit, we should be able to subsist in it without being anxious all the time. But we weaken ourselves, just like the astronauts, by removing ourselves from it all the time. And then when we have to remain it for it, in it for a, a certain length of time, its burdens just seem to be amplified. So it's no wonder that we're raising a generation of people that seem to be perpetually nervous and jumpy all the time uh, because they're ill-equipped to handle the adversities of just a normal life. I know someone who is in the twilight of his career as a psychologist working at a university, so specifically with young people, and I remember asking him if over the course of his career, he's noticed a shift in the kinds of afflictions that he has had to treat. And he said, yes. He said it used to be a variety of issues that he would have to address, but for the past decade or so, it's just anxiety. Everyone is struggling with anxiety. And it seems to correlate precisely with the widespread adoption of smartphones and social media. These things that are with us all the time in our pockets, vibrating and whispering at us to escape escape, and when we succumb to that temptation, we end up being startled back to the real world that we've been neglecting because our need to be attentive to it has become critical. The truth is, this is a choice that we are making. This condition of perpetual anxiety and irritability as these two worlds compete for our attention is self-inflicted. There's no rational reason for us to choose to escape our lives on a regular basis. That's what sleep is for. Like, take yourself out of your, your habits and your everyday experiences for a second to try to look at them objectively and, and honestly ask yourself, because this is absurd, how does it make sense for a creature adapted to live in this world or created for this world, depending on how you look at it, to be easily attempted to want to escape from it routinely, habitually. I think that the truth is that we're trying to actually escape ourselves. We're uncomfortable by default in our own human condition. There's something at war within ourselves that makes it tempting to want to eject our consciousness into some kind of a refuge where we don't have to deal with the drama of the human condition as we are. But honestly, how can this be? How is this possible unless something has gone wrong with us? Unless this life and this condition isn't what we were made for? And that's exactly what the, the, the Christian tradition claims. We were made for this life, but then by our own free choice, we ruptured that harmony by disobeying God who established and sustained that harmony. But by rejecting his vision for our lives, we also rejected that harmony. And now we have to learn to endure this tension and this conflict that exists within ourselves. And we also have to learn to find our way back to that harmony. And that happens not by escaping, but as Jesus said, enduring the suffering that comes with this life and this fallen nature, and being reconciled to God in his plan of restoration and salvation.